chapter 4. We're going to begin there tonight. And we're going to see what the Lord is going to do. Um, the Lord in prayer this afternoon <clears throat> the Lord told me uh, some of you he told me your problem so let me explain to you what your problem is okay this ministry here the purpose of this ministry is to make disciples and some of you don't want to be disciples. So you have a right to leave if you want to leave. The purpose of this ministry is to make disciples. Now we're going to explain to you what a disciple is. So if you want to be a disciple, you can. But I'm not going to, the Lord have instructed me, and that's from you leaders all the way down. If you don't want to be a disciple, you're not going to do no work here. The purpose of this ministry is to make disciples. Make disciples, all right? So let's see what a disciple is, all right? We're going to see what a disciple is. And prophet, Lord, I want you to come up and, and read what a disciple is. They ought to be able to do that back there themselves. They're supposed to be trained to do that. I want y'all to listen closely because some of y'all's problem is this. Those of you that have not hooked up with this ministry yet, your problem is you don't want to be a disciple. And you're going to learn what a disciple is tonight. Then you choose whether you want to be one or not. But what you're not going to do, you're not going to stop this ministry. This is the, uh, the Lord sent me down here for one purpose, is to make disciples. So you're going to understand what a disciple is. And if you don't meet the Bible's qualifications, you're not a disciple. Now, we're not talking about no church goer, what we've been accustomed to. We're talking about real disciples, real disciples, okay? Now, who don't understand what I just said? Because every one of you is going to have a right to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, we're not... We're not talking about it in a cult. We're talking about a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see what Jesus said about being a disciple. All right? We're going to, you all going to understand what a disciple really is. So you choose whether you want to be one or not. But that's the purpose of this ministry is to make disciples. All right? Okay. Go read what a disciple is. Disciple. One who accepts and assists in the spreading of the doctrine of another. Okay, okay. One who accepts and do what? Assist. Assist. Now, I want you to, you stay right there. I want you to go in the book of Matthew, because we're going to give you scripture for everything, for absolutely everything, all right? In the book of Matthew, all right, chapter 4, Jesus said this. And he said unto them, verse 19, follow me and I will what? I will make you fishers of men. Now, read the definition again. One who accepts, accepts and assists and assist in spreading the doctrine, in spreading the doctrine of another. Of Je in this case, Jesus. Not yours, but Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And most of these churchgoers are not disciples. Most of these folk that go to church are not disciples. Coming to a church sanctuary don't make you a disciple. It, coming, to the, coming here do not make you a disciple. Coming here will help you learn how to be a disciple. But it's the word, following the word, that make you a disciple. So the purpose of the church, of, okay, Jesus has one purpose for the church, one, and that is to make disciples. That's why uh, 
one purpose, and that's to make disciples. Any question? And what disciples do, disciples become fishers of men. That means Jesus expected his people to take his doctrine and spread it. His word and spread it. Not man's doctrine, but his word and spread it. Now let me say this to you. Man's doctrine is this. Jesus was born on December 25th. That's a, I'm giving you an example of man's doctrine. How you know? It ain't in the Word. Man's doctrine is this. Jesus died on a good Friday. That's two good examples of man's doctrine. So you, won't be, so you ain't going to stand before the Lord and say you didn't know what man's doctrine is. Man's doctrine is what human beings come up with that's not in the Word. And they expect for you to follow. Okay, any question? We are live, correct? Okay, any question? If anybody have any question out there, they can ask. Let me say it again. Man's doctrine is what man come up with that's not in the Word. Do you all understand that? Because, see, we was taught by tradition growing up that it was okay to do what man said when it was not in the Word. And so man made it a doctrine to the point, now as we said uh, a few days ago, that people think if you don't celebrate this day with a tree, Santa Claus, and all that kind of mess, you ain't saved. That ain't true. A tree, Santa Claus, ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Like the bunny rabbit ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. He said it ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Not, not any of that have anything to do with Jesus. And you can see what kind of effect it had in this world. What you mean? People think that that kind of celebration is more important than celebrating Jesus. Meaning this, than talking about Jesus. Than spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not intend for us to celebrate a doctrine that's made by man. Jesus intended for us to celebrate his doctrine that he sent by himself. Jesus told us a couple of things as the New Testament church to do. Uh, be baptized after you believe. Celebrate communion. That's what Jesus told us to do. Those are two things that Jesus told us to do. The rest of these things Jesus didn't tell us to do. And some of you that actually challenge folk on the internet, they think you devil because of what man done taught them. But they cannot give you scripture example that Jesus said what he said. <clears throat> they cannot. You know why? Jesus didn't say it. Now, I want you to think about this. If Jesus wanted us to celebrate stuff like that, why didn't he put it in the Word? He did communion. He did water baptism. So why didn't he do that? Because Jesus knew that people was going to corrupt, man was going to corrupt his doctrine. There are more people, more kids, know more about Santa Claus. They look forward to seeing Santa Claus and not Jesus. You know why? Because of man's doctrine. I keep telling y'all these preachers going to go to hell. They're going to face God. God ain't changed nothing. Jesus hadn't changed nothing. Some of your cousins as preachers going to stand before God for spreading lies and stuff. All that stuff got in the church, but you won't find it in the Word. So now we got kids growing up rejoice to see Santa Claus coming, but hate to see Jesus coming. And the kids didn't do this, y'all. The kids didn't spread this mess, y'all. The adults did. The adults spread that lie. And they know it's a lie. And you, even those of you that celebrated, 
you know you're celebrating a lie. Though you sneak and celebrate it, you know it's a lie. You know it's a lie. You know for a fact it's a bald faced fat man with a red suit on. Lie. You know it's a lie. But you're too afraid to stand up against the lie. Yes, go ahead. You need to go to the mic. You're too afraid. So Jesus said that our job is to make disciples, not make people religious and follow their own intuition of what some other person say, but follow the word. And let me tell you something. Those of you sitting in here, you're going to pay for it too. Every one of you sitting in here, you're going to pay for it because you're hearing the truth. Whether you walk it out or not, you're hearing nothing but the whole truth. And let me tell you something. That's why I know I'm a blessing. Because I'm telling you the whole truth. Go ahead. So, Apostle, we have tonight set aside for Bible study. Mm -hmm. So all the ministries that had Bible study set aside tonight, and they, they didn't have Bible study because of this day, they took on man's doctrine. They, the they, they following man's doctrine. Now, I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for that. So let me do this. They following man's doctrine. Let me say it again. You following something that man instituted and not Christ or God. Now, you can, you can put up all kind of signs you want saying Jesus is the reason for the season. You won't find Jesus said that's the reason for the season. Now, if it was so important, why didn't he? It ought to be somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. It should have stopped. It should have, it should have parked somewhere in Acts. It should have spent time in, at least in Corinthians. And Paul wrote to Corinthians. In one of them, it should have slept overnight with Peter. It should have ate dinner with John. And it should have ended up in Revelation. But nowhere do you find this mess. Why? It's a man's tradition. It's man doctrine. And they say that the reason why we do this is because we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Well, you know what? Real Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus every day. Every day. So the reason why we take communion, because he told us to, and the reason why we don't sprinkle like Catholics do, we baptize because the Bible says baptize. And baptism is totally get your hair wet. To mess up your perm. <laughs> to totally get you wet from head, that's baptism. Because it represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So real Christians don't need all this mess. And that's why we don't celebrate it here. And we're not going to celebrate it here. Why? Because it's not a doctrine for real Christians. It's for paganism. That's what it's for, right? So the Bible told us that Jesus said, go and make fishes of men. That's our job. Not just mine, but every so-called sanctuary you see, that pastor's job is to train people to go out and fish for G fish fish be fisher men ladies too because M E N M A N is a part of woman or women so we ain't gonna have no uh whatever you call it yeah no debate or nothing you all right but anyway the purpose is to make fishes to go out and make fishes of men that's the purpose of every ministry that the Lord raised up. Every one of them, every one of us, we are obligated and commanded by God and his Christ to make fishers, to go out and make disciples of you. Now, some of your problems, you hear, you come into a ministry that job and agenda is to make fishers. And some of you don't want to be fishing. That's your problem. Some of you, and I know it because the Lord told me, some of you don't want to be fishing.
you want to come to a church where you can hear praise and worship, hear the word, but don't have to let the word mold and shape you. You want to come to, and then you want to feel satisfied in your judgment. And that's why you don't strive to become like Jesus. But Jesus was a fisherman. Let me say it again. Jesus was a fisherman. Jesus was not a doctor so-and-so. He saved doctors. He was a fisherman. And his job was for God to fish for people that wanted to be fished for him. Or disciples. And that's why when you, those of you who read your Bible, you will read terms like the disciples of Jesus versus the disciple of John or the disciple of Pharisee. Now read again the definition of a disciple. One who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrine of another but Jesus. Read it, talk. Read it again. One who accepts One who accepts and assist. And then start assisting. You know what assisting means, right? Okay, who don't know what assisting means? All right, go ahead. In spreading the doctrine of another. Okay, in spreading the word of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. That's the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church. Now, I want you to go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And let's establish that again. That's the purpose of the church, is to make disciples. To make disciples. To make, not for you to make the word, but for the word to make you. All right? In, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, everybody got it? It says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and what? For what purpose? Okay, to bring the, the believers. Notice he says saints. <laughs> He's, he didn't say sinners. It's, he says saints. Saints are people that were once sinners, but now they are born again. For the perfection of the saints, to bring Christian people to a place of maturity. For the work of the ministry. Oh, the ministry has work. Yes. Wow. Do you believe it? Yes. Ministry really has work. So if you got a ministry, you got work. And if you got work, you got a ministry. Mm. Oh. So the ministry, okay, so the ministry is not for anniversary, hallelujah, and ch selling chicken and fish done. The ministry is for work. So wait a minute. Work means that work is an opportunity to make workers. Because the people that are workers, they work. You don't work on the street corner all day. So work means you have a job. There's a job to do. So real Christians are being made disciples for the work of the ministry. For the edification of what? Whoa. So that means that if a person is a disciple, that means they are working for Christ. So the purpose of the ministry is to make disciples. How you know? That's what Jesus did. To make fishes. So, when did that change? It did. When 
man got a hold to it. When man got a hold to it, it changed. So a lot of folk grew up in man's word, and they have come to the conclusion that if I go to church, I'm working. If I show up, I'm work. And that's enough. But my Bible tells me that Jesus ordained, raised up the church to be disciples, which means to spread his doctrine. Not the Pope or somebody else's doctrine, but to spread his doctrine. So, if, if I am a real disciple, what am I doing? I'm spreading the doctrine of Jesus Christ. I'm spreading his purpose, all right? Okay, you can be seated, all right? Okay, now, let's go back. Now, so, understanding that, then, as preachers and teachers of the word, our job is to help make disciples out of those of you that want to be disciples. So, when you come to a ministry, that purpose is to make disciples, and you don't want to be a disciple, you're going to be miserable because you don't want to be a disciple. You want to get to heaven, but you don't want to be a disciple. You want to come to the ministry, but all that disciple stuff, ship stuff, you don't want a part of that. But that's the purpose of the ministry. It's like going, <laughs> it's like going, working at the Ford Company using principles of GM. That ain't going to work. I'm just giving you an illustration. That ain't going to work. You're going to mess up in measurement. Because a GM engine is not like a Ford engine. Their engines, they basic principal operations the same, but their measurements are totally different. You can't take a head off a, a full 27 GM in I mean, uh, Ford and put it on a 454 Chevy block. You can try, but it ain't going to work. You can even make up your own gasket, but it ain't going to work. You can even buy your own boats, but oh, you won't be able to boat everything. You might get one boat in, and the rest of them going to be out of line if you get one in. Okay. So when you try to come to a ministry that the Lord has raised up a real, a real prophetic ministry, apostolic ministry, but you want to have the religious attitude, that ain't going to work. That, that, it's kind of like when the scripture says trying to put new wine into old bottles. And what Jesus, what that means is, Jesus was telling the folks there that you can't follow this new doctrine under the law. That's what he was saying. You can't, you, you can't do this. And what he was saying, you cannot follow New Testament teaching obeying the law. Because they are different. They are different. The law got sacrifices. The New Testament got a sacrifice. And his name is Jesus. So what y'all problem is, those of you that got a problem, lazy and slow, can't pick up. You still walking in tradition of the man's doctrine. It could be Baptist, Methodist, um, Charismatic non-denomination, but it's man's doctrine. And man's doctrine make you satisfied by coming to church and maybe having a little program every now and then. That 
That's man's doctrine. But Jesus' doctrine is, I came to make disciples. I came to make you fishers for men. And every one of you here understand what discipleship we just read out of y'all dictionary. It means someone that actually accepts the Bible, accepts Jesus' teaching, and then help spread it. Help spread, all right? That's the purpose, all right? Okay, any questions? Before we move on. Okay, now, um, in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, Matthew 9, and we're teaching on tonight <laughs> what's happening. Go ahead. Pastor, we had a question from Facebook. Go ahead. It says, today a pastor posted on Facebook, Behold, the Son of God was born. And a person who is saved told me it's possible that the pastor really don't know the truth. I didn't believe this, so my question is, is it possible that a pastor doesn't know that Christmas is a lie. He know. He know. But he choose, because of fear, he choose to spread a lie. Because that pastor can't prove that Jesus was born on this time of year. But we can prove that he did. Not. birth this time of year. And most of them know it. But because of religion, because it has such an impact on the economy, merchandise, they too afraid to stand up and tell people the whole truth. So what they do? They try to put Jesus in this season. And let me tell you something, folks. How many of you think you can put God in anything. Well, how many of you think you can put the Son of God in anything? If you can put Jesus in something, then that means you're greater than him. So that means the God you're serving is your puppet. And I don't care who, it can come from Crip, O'Dollar, TDJ, all of them are liars. The Pope, every one of them is a L-I-E, everyone, even you. Every one of you that said that, you are a liar. Because Jesus did not, he was not born this time of year. And by the way, Jesus was only born once. Only one time. Only one time. Now let me tell you something. If I could be born, and then a year later go back and be born again, I'd probably do it as I get tired of it. I'll never get old. I got the option. If I get up to five and go back, if I get 50 and I have the ability to go back and be born again, I'm going back. I don't care what you say. I'm going back. I'm going back. My 50th anniversary will be reborn again. I'll never get 51 years old. I will never... 51 won't see me. I live, and when I get 50, I'm going back again. I'm going back in the channel of time, and I'm coming back. Mills and Bush have to take care of me. Him and Bernice have to take care of me. Hey, and I ain't asking them. I'm just going to go back. Hey, it's me. See, let me tell you this. When you believe a lie, a lie cannot be proven fact because it's a lie. So the Bible says just for a moment, so you got to keep going. And then you got to make up reasons why you're doing what you're doing. The Bible, why you think I'm telling you the truth? Because my reason is the Bible said no lies are the truth. So I'm telling you the truth. Because the Bible said no lie is of the truth. None. I don't care who you are. I mean, no lie is of the truth. And when you tell a lie, you got to keep telling lies. And then trying to convince people to believe your lie. It's amazing, folks. 
What's going on here? It's amazing what's going on here. It just absolutely is a, it's, it's like, man, God. And folk, the children are not doing this. The children don't care whether Santa Claus gives them the toy. As long as you give them a toy, they don't care. The only reason why they ask you about Santa Claus, you don't lie to them. That's the only reason why they ask you about Santa Claus, because you done told a lie. And no lie is of the truth. So the purpose of the word, and Jesus knew that they were going to lie. So Jesus said, I'm going to raise up a group of people and make them disciples so they can go out and spread my doctrine. And part of his doctrine says, no lie is of the truth. None. So the moment you hear a lie, you should resist that thing not because of your feeling, but because it's a lie. And because of what Jesus said. I don't care whether your mama, your daddy, your grandmama, or your grandfather said it. It's still a lie. So the purpose of the church is to tell people the truth. So Jesus said, I want to raise people up that's going to stand and spread the truth. They might not be perfect, but they're going to spread the truth. They're not going to get caught up in worldly doctrine, but they're going to spread the truth. I don't care how many light bulbs you got on your property. It still don't make it the truth. Oh, you can light up every ant mile. You can light up every, everything that moves. You can put a bulb on it. You have rats running through the yard with lights on it. It still don't make the truth. Look at this man. Y'all oh, ain't blind. You see it. You ain't stupid either. You see it. Just say, I'm celebrating something for man. It'll be better to say, you know what? I'm the human race, we're going to set aside the 25th just to celebrate it and leave Jesus out of it because he ain't in it. It'll be better for you because then you don't have to lie. Every year, you can just say, you know what? We set aside today just to celebrate something. That will be better than trying to put him in something because you, you're not putting Jesus in nothing. The moment you put Jesus in something, that means you got power over him. The Lord put you into what he wants you to be in, all right? Now, my question to you today, how many of you felt cheated because you didn't celebrate Christmas? How many of you feel sad, depressed, and down? Now, don't raise your hand for this next question. How many of you celebrated in silence? Don't raise your hand. How many of you celebrated hidden? Because some of you didn't show up for prayer today. So how many of you celebrated like the Masons in secret? Don't answer that. Just to show the hypocrisy in you. The purpose of the church is to spread the truth. And real disciples spread the truth. And if you are a real disciple, the word determines who you are. No matter what you call yourself, the word determines exactly who you are. Any question before we move on? Now, in the book of Matthew, once again, chapter 9, listen to this. Verse 17. Where well, verse 16 and 17, it says this. No man put a piece of new cloth unto old garment. For that which is poured to fill it up takes away from the garment. And the rent is made worse. Neither, excuse me, do men put new wine into old bottles. For else the bottles break and the wine runs out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now what Jesus was doing, 
Jesus was telling these folk about the law. And what he was saying is this. Jesus was saying, this new doctrine that I'm teaching you, you can't follow this new doctrine staying under the law, Old Testament law. Because it'll be like taking wine, new wine. Back then, they didn't have glass bottles. Wine was made out of goat skin or whatever. Okay. And if you take a goat skin that had been full of wine for a period of time, and you empty it, and then you make new wine and put it into that goat skin, it's going to cause that goat skin to leak. So what you have to do is take new wine and brand new goat skin bottles and put it together, and they are they age together. So what Jesus was saying is this. This new doctrine, because see, the Jews tried to stay under the law. And Jesus said, what I'm teaching you, you can't even receive this unless something happened to you. And what I'm telling you, the reason why a part of you in here cannot be disciples, because really you are not born again. He was telling the church this, the people back then, in order for you to follow what I'm going to teach you, go to St. John 3. you got to be born again. St. John 3. you got to be born again. You can't be religious. You can't just join the church. You have to be born into it. The Holy, you have to have a Holy Ghost experience of new birth. In St. John 3, so this is telling those of you that struggle with this doctrine, the reason why you struggle with it is because you are not born again. And born again has nothing to do with water baptism. Born again has to do with the Holy Spirit working in you, bringing you alive to the Word. Because, see, water baptism don't have the power to convert your heart. Water baptism do not have the power to give you joy of believing the Word. Water baptism don't have that at all. But the Holy Ghost does. When the Holy Spirit brings a person to a place of new birth or being born again, like it says in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, he puts inside of you God's will. So now you have a will to want to believe this word. Something you never had and water baptism can't give you that. Let me say it again. Water baptism cannot save you, nor can water baptism give you that. The purpose of water baptism is to show a good conscience towards God because Jesus, he died, was buried three days and three nights, and rose up again. Baptism is symbolic to us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's what it is. And that's why baptism is only for believers. The first time I got baptized when I was 12 years old, I wasn't saved. So the only thing I did is got wet. So when I got saved in 1978, I went back because now I'm born again. I'm understanding what it's about now. I went back and got baptized again. Why? Because my Bible told me that an unbeliever is not qualified to be baptized. An unbeliever is not qualified to be baptized. Baptism is only for believers. What you mean? In the book of Matthew 28, Mark 16, and also Acts chapter 2, Jesus said this, and those that believe, and then he put an order to it. So when you get baptized and you are not a believer, you are not really baptized. Why? You're trying to do it your way. Baptism is only for believers, those that really are born again. All right? Any question? Before we move on. Any question? And nowhere you'll find in the Bible where the Bible says anything different, because it's right. All right? So, in order for you to receive this new wine or this new doctrine, you have to be that new creature, which means born again. You have to be born again. Before I got saved, I went to church, sung on choir, read Sunday school lessons, 
uh, participate in Children's Day, read poem, but I wasn't saved. Had no desire to study the word, no desire to pray, unless I was going to get a whooping. And the thing about it, every time I prayed, he didn't answer because I got a whooping. So I know he didn't answer. So for me, that wasn't working. That was the prayer. Prayer was not working for me at all. I don't know about you, but prayer was not working for me. Because it was, I wouldn't have got a, got a whooping, all right? And sometimes I got two. So that tells me that I'm critical. It didn't work, all right? So I want you to understand that. I, we want you to understand what real decide, the purpose of the ministry is. I don't care whether, I don't care who you, you can, these TV preachers that make you think you saved based on their doctrine, my advice is this. Let the word say you are born again. Let the word says you say. Do you want to pay attention? You 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 better you better move that the child over there to you, all right? Because I will put her out of you, all right? Because I don't talk to her today, okay? I'm not gonna talk to you anymore, all right? I want you to understand me. I'm not gonna talk to you anymore now. Um, this thing is so critical that people are leaving you, going to hell thinking they saved, and they are not. And they're thinking they saved, like some of you, because of what man done told you that the Bible don't say. That the, if you want to base your salvation, do not base your salvation on what Apostle Bush says or any other preacher. Base your salvation on what this word says, because this word tells you whether you saved or not. This word lets you know whether you are a real Christian or not. You know why? Because this word tells you how to get to heaven. And the only thing I'm doing is telling you what the word says. No, these other preachers, these other so-called TV preachers, I don't, T.D. Jakes, that, that dude in California, whoever he is, I don't care who it is, in Atlanta, not any of us, no preacher can put you in heaven. None of them. None of us can put you in heaven. Only the only thing that can put you in heaven is this word. And that's why those of you that don't have a desire to study the word and come to the house of the Lord like you should, you ain't saved. You're a hypocrite. And I'm telling y'all to your face, that's what you are. I'm not going to deceive you. You know why? Because you got a chance to be a real disciple or a fake. You got a chance to let religion tell you or promise you something that religion cannot produce. Or you got a chance to let the word tell you something that it will produce. It's up to you. But here, we're going to make sure that you understand the truth, all right? Any questions? And that's to anybody. Any questions as we move on? Talking about the truth. And the truth is the only thing that makes people free, all right? So now we understand that, okay, you got to be born again. If you're not, you can't understand the precious meaning of this word. You will take this word and you will use it to your advantage instead of humbling yourself to this word because you see the value in this word. You will misuse this word. You do abuse this word. Why? Because you can't comprehend the importance of the word unless you are born again Christian. And the only way you can be born again, the Holy Spirit brings you to a place of being born again. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, let's go to Romans chapter 8. This is what the Holy Spirit does in Romans chapter 8. Now, we want to, any questions, feel free to ask. We want to help you. We, we want to help you understand the truth so you won't be caught up in some old man's doctrine because that's how he feels. Or that's what he believes. Just because you believe something don't make it right. You better make sure it's right what you believe. That's what you better do. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 11, it says this. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that what? Okay, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. What he does, he will quicken or bring you alive to Christ. 
And all, all of a sudden, inside of you, you have, a, number one, a desire for the truth. And really, believe it or not, your eyes really open. Not your fleshly eyes, but the eyes that's more important than your fleshly eyes. Your spiritual, all of a sudden, it's an awakening. When you begin to understand the difference in how you used to live versus what you want to do now. If you don't have that in you, you're not saved. And folks, these folks can't save you. They cannot save you. Only thing that can save you is Christ and his word. That's it. And that's why we have to preach Jesus. That's why here, that's all we preach, Jesus Christ. And we ain't changing. That's all we hear, because he's the only one that can save, all right? Any question? Okay. Who don't understand what was just said? All right. So this scripture in the book of Romans tells us what the Holy Spirit does, all right? Now, go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Now, when a person really becomes born again, all of a sudden, something happens inside of them because of the will of God being inside of them, all right? Matthew chapter, now you can let these deadbeat preachers tell you lies and, and charm you like a snake if you want them. But I promise you this, the word says the blind leading the blind, not just the preacher, but you going to hell too. So that means the preacher that, you, the, the false preacher that you follow now, you'll be able to follow him in hell. So he can, or she can be your everlasting preacher. Y'all can spend eternity, y'all can waltz around there in hell together. I don't think y'all will. I don't think you will love. <laughs> now when you get there, I don't believe that's going to happen. Because there ain't no love in hell. All right? Matthew chapter 5, all right? Lord Jesus. Verse 6 says, blessed are them that do what? For what? For they shall be, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. Now, if you are a saved Christian, inside of you, you begin to want to study the word. Something that you don't do with your flesh. People in the flesh, they'll read the Bible. And just because you read the Bible don't mean you say. Because people in the flesh will read the Bible to try to justify themselves or try to attack you. But real Christians read the Bible because they want to learn what they're saying. Because they want to do what they're saying. Now, if in that process they see you, <laughs> that comes with the pain. That, it, it, all of it comes in one page. The Bible, okay, the Bible shows us us. The Bible is not written to show us the stars and the moon, even though it's in there. The purpose of the word is to show us us. And you, let me tell you, okay, before I move on about the word stupid and ignorant, okay, let me tell everybody. Ignorant, a person is ignorant, and all of us are ignorant, about something. Meaning this. We hadn't had the opportunity to learn something. So we ignorant. Stupid is when you have learned something and you refuse to believe what you learn because you don't want to. You refuse to believe what you learn. I don't want to believe that. And it's the truth. That's stupid. The Bible calls that foolishness and ignorance. The Bible says a fool despises wisdom and knowledge. That's what it says. That's what the word says. God said you're a fool. Now, God saying you're a fool have more impact than I do. So, instead of getting mad at me, why don't you get mad at him? Because he's the only one who can do something about your foolish attitude. <laughs> All right? That's what, that's what he's saying. Now, I know some of you think this way. I got time. Okay. Just because you got a watch on your hand don't mean you got time. Just because you're young don't mean you got time. 
Just because you feel healthy and good don't mean you got time. There are people that have dropped absolutely dead. There are folk that was physically fit, teaching you how to be physically fit, and was running and dropped dead. So don't, don't tell me that you got time. The Bible said time is in the Lord's hand. That's what it said. Now don't be squinching up in your face at me. I'm just trying to help you so you can see what you need to do according to the word. Are there any questions? Are there anybody tugging right now, fighting between your spirit and soul? Does anybody want to challenge what's been taught so far? Ain't nobody got no comments? Now, if you ain't got no comments here, y'all not having it on Facebook. Because the best time to open up and challenge is why you're here. Because we don't mind being challenged. Because you cannot overcome the truth. All right? So again, are there any questions? Okay, all right, we're going to move on. Move on. All right, now, so, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they feel shall be filled. So now, if you're a Christian, you got to hunger and thirst for what's right. So you find righteousness in the word. Now, I want you to go to Psalms 84, if you're a Christian. Because your new year is going to depend on how the Lord deals with you. If you. And some of you, you really absolutely, you need the Lord to deal with you. Because some of you, you hadn't made no progress at all. None whatsoever. Some of you are in backwards instead of forward, and the Lord want to help you. Psalms 84. Psalms 84. Now we just read in Matthew 5 and 6 that if you're a Christian inside of you, there's a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And a hunger and a thirst is not something I just want to taste. I'm not really hungry. I just want to snack on something. When you get hungry, you want to eat. When you get hungry, bump snacks. What you want to do? You want to eat. You want to eat, all right? Now, in the book of um, Psalms 84, I want you to listen to this. This is also what happened to you. All of a sudden, you know, I grew up going to church. And like I told you before, my sister and I have sat in the back seat of my dad's car saying to each other, not to them, but to each other, once we get old, become a grown-up, I would never, absolutely never, set foot in a church again. I'm tired of going there. And back then, when you went to church back then, you got there at 8 o'clock, and it might be 5 or 6 before you leave up in the evening. And most of the time, if you're a child, they put you in the back where you couldn't hear the preacher what he's saying, but you know he was up there doing something, but you didn't know what he was saying. They put you in the back so they don't have no problem with you when they should have had you up front. But in my day, that's what happened. You will go to, you go to church and you will be there and really the only thing you learn is collection. Can I have one more dollar? Can I get another dollar? We almost got it to ten. So can I get another dollar? Can I have another? Jesus. <laughs> That's what you heard. You can say what you want, 
But that's what you heard. Didn't even know that the church wasn't a building. But you thought, and we still got some folk still call the church. Uh, I'm going to church. Oh, so you ain't the church, huh? Well, won't you get saved and you will stop going to church because you're the church. You just go to the sanctuary. They've been impregnated with false doctrine. And they don't want to give that up. They don't, people, let me tell you something. A building is not going to heaven. So if you're part of the building, you shouldn't be leaving when it rains. You should be supporting something. You should be a two-by-four, a window, or maybe part of the shingle. In the book of Psalms, listen to this. This is what happened to Christians. Verse 1, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, even fainteth, for the courts of my Lord. Start right there. When you become a Christian, nobody has to make you come to the house of the Lord. The reason, those of you that show up every now and then, because you're a hypocrite. And we're telling you to your face. When you become saved, in your heart, you go every time a, a door open. When you saved, how you know? I experienced that firsthand. When I got saved, it was in the summertime. And I went to everybody's revival. I hauled, took Minister Bush and hauled everybody's revival. When the door opened, I was there. Four miles. St. Catherine runs. I, I, I went to places I didn't know exist. Because I didn't go when I wasn't saved. I only went to the runs. That's it. As far as me, runs was the only place that was there, you know, even though I passed by others. But when you get saved, in your heart, you hunger and thirst to be in the presence of the Lord when you say. Now, I didn't know all those places I went. A lot of them, the Lord wasn't there. I found out later as I got more in the Word. There's a bunch of tradition. A bunch of tradition being guided by men. Being guided by men, they give you a little bit of scriptures, and then the rest of it is defiled. So you show up or grow up being misled. But when you get saved, you have a hunger for the Word. You don't care whether your tie is dirty or your shirt is wrinkled. You're going to get to the word because inside of you is hunger. And when you got preachers, people call themselves preachers and don't like the word, they false. When you got preachers that don't have a hunger for the word, they ain't sent by the Lord. They sent by themselves. They sent by man. Because we ain't talking about preachers yet. We're talking about just being born again. You have a hunger for the word. We ain't got the leadership here. We're talking about real Christians. Inside of you, if you're a Christian, you have a hunger for the gospel. If you're not a Christian, you do not. You can take it or leave it. You don't have that hunger for the word like the Bible says. You can, you religious. You are not saved. And that's according to the scripture. Now listen to this. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. How beautiful is your house. My soul longest, yea, even faint for the what? My heart and my flesh cries out. When you get saved, when a person gets saved, they love to be in the presence of Jesus. They love it. They love it. They love it. Some of you, you used to be here all the time, but now you are a part-time, if there is such a word, a part-time show up. Why? That love for the word is not there like it was. How you know? Folks, if ain't no gas in your car, it ain't cranking. Let me say it again. If there's no gas in your car, it ain't cranking. If there's no love for the Lord in your word, in, in your heart, you ain't moving. You don't move. You, what you do, what you do is this. 
you begin to base your relationship on you and not the word. Now, my Bible tells me that a real Christian has a hunger for the word. And they love to be in the presence of the Lord. Love to be in there. That means if you love to be in there, it's going to show. If you don't, you ain't fooling me or him. It's going to show. But because of your half part-time love, if there's such a thing, you give part-time You don't care whether you be here or not. You don't care whether you be in the presence of the Lord. And then you try to tell yourself excuses. And some of you purposely try to be late. Some of you purposely try to schedule your workload so you won't show up here. Because you know when you get here, you ain't getting nothing but the truth. Some of you, your attitude is, I don't want to hear what he got to say. But let me tell you something. If you ever show up here, what I say on Wednesday could be repeated Sunday morning. The Lord knows how to do a thing. Let me t- the Lord knows how to guide his servant. The Lord knows what to do. He just knows. He knows exactly what's in your part-time heart, all right? Now listen to this. I'm telling you the truth. My soul long that you even faint for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cries out for the living God. When a, when, if you're a real Christian, if you are really born again, there's such a desire to learn so much about this Jesus. And it's in your heart that even if something happened legitimate to keep you from coming, you feel bad. You feel bad. In your spirit, there's a man. I know I'm missing something. And let me tell you something. You are. I just want to answer you. You definitely are. That's You don't grow like you should. Because let me tell you something. None of you in here, not any of you, can be real leaders without the word. You can't not be a leader without the word. You are a liar and the word ain't in you if you think you can. Because it's the word that makes us leaders. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that calls us to mature and grow. And when you don't have a desire, a legitimate desire for that, you don't grow. And then you don't go. That's why the Bible keeps telling us that there's going to be a whole lot of people and there are going to be more people in hell than is in heaven. More people in hell. The Bible says it. The Bible will tell you. Any questions? Before we move on. All right. It says, listen to this though. It says, Yea, the sparrow has found in house, and the swallow a nest for himself where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy heart. They shall still be praising thee. Okay. The person that has a legitimate desire to continue with the Lord, the Bible says they are blessed. And they're going to always have a genuine praise, not a put on. Your dance or whatever you do, your jiggle, don't mean it's praise. It's what's in your heart. And let me tell you this. You can't be a praiser when you can take it and leave it. You ain't a praiser when you can take the word and leave it. You just like that old foul sacrifice that God told Israel in Isaiah 1, I don't want no more of your sacrifice. Why? Because it's defiled. It's messed up. It's messed up. It's phony. That's why the Bible says, in the book of Romans 12 and 1, the Lord says, I beseech you, I beseech you to present your whole spirit, soul, and body. Not just your body and your emotions, soul, but your spirit too. 
All of you. Other than that, you don't ever meet him when it's not all of you. You might, your flesh might feel good because you like a certain song. But there's no divine nature being part, imparted in you to make you strong or why? Because that's all you is, is flesh. Your whole spirit, soul, and body be presented before the Lord as a living sacrifice. That's what the scripture means. That means all of you. All of you. You want to, your body is going to do what it's supposed to do, and you're going to get emotional about my Lord. That's when you're born again, all right? Any question before we move on? All right. Now, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of him. Okay, what it does, when you come before the Lord the right way with your spirit, he imparts, like Peter said, inside of you more of his divine nature. In other words, he gives you more strength to walk out this word. That's what he does. And then all of a sudden you become a conqueror instead of being conquered. Why? Because you're receiving supernatural strength from the Lord by way of the Holy Ghost. And you're getting stronger in his word. And you're not ashamed or afraid or intimidated. Why? Because you're getting stronger in his word. All right? Any, any question? Now, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Chapter 10. Jesus said it this way. Now, the reason why some of you Ain't gonna like what I'm reading. Because you'll find yourself being found wanting. Coming up short. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 8, it says this. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and good works. So how am I going to provoke my brother and sister to love and good works? By not forsaking the assembling of myself together. In other words, those of you that can come here when you get ready, according to the word, you are not saved. You're just a religious hypocrite. That's all you are. And we te- we're going to tell you this before you go to hell. So you don't have to go to hell. So the Lord is showing mercy to you through his word. He says, not forsaking the assembly of yourself together as the manner of some here. Oh, so that was something that was. Whoa. So that's where you at. Are you the sum that is? Good question, ain't it? But exhort one another, which means to earnestly warn each other. And then he said, well, how often should I do this? And so much the more as you see. So I should, I should do it more tomorrow than I'm doing it now. And then I should do it the next day, Friday, more than I'm doing it Thursday. Because each day, it gets closer to the coming of my Savior. And my Savior is coming back. Now, you might not come back here Sunday. But my, I'm hoping you will, though. But my Savior is coming back. He is coming back, y'all. I'm back. He is coming back. So, when a person, I noticed this. Some of you, when you got saved, you couldn't stay You couldn't stay in the world. You had to be here. But after a while, you start getting weary. And you show up when you get ready. Not all of you, some of you. You make excuses. Let me tell you something. Okay. My job, I had a job too. And if I 
want to be on my job. More than I want to be in the presence of the Lord, something wrong with me. Now you can say whatever you want to say. Something, your priorities ain't right. Now let me let me tell you about I'll, I told you about Sister Latanya today. I'm gonna tell you about it, those of you who weren't here. Latanya, a few months back, had backslid. She had gotten weary, and she was talking, thinking about not coming back here. But you know what she did? She fought through and showed back up. Now listen to this now. The Lord told me in prayer this morning, if she hadn't showed up, they wouldn't have had the house. If she hadn't showed back up, they wouldn't have had the house. You know why? Because he wasn't going to give that revelation to nobody else. She fought. That's why the Bible said, be now weary in well-doing. Whenever you start getting weary and you quit, your blessing was just around the corner. But you quit. If she had not pressed through, repented, and she didn't lie like some of you. She said she wasn't in the wrong place. And she fought through. Didn't know. Did not know. She absolutely did not know that the Lord had a new address for her. Both spiritually and physically. And the Bible says, still said, the blessing of the Lord make it rich. I don't see no sorrow on her face. Just look at her. Just look at her. She, her oh, mom. But she battled before she got there. She battled before she got there. She had to battle through. Some of you, you ain't doing good. And you know you ain't. You, you're losing. Why? Because you don't trust in the word. And some of you, the reason why you're not blessed in the same place, because you're failing. The Bible said, be not weary in well-doing. Not foolish doing. Not worldly doing, but well-doing. Be not weary in following the word. Because there's a due season coming for you. And you have no idea what that season going to be until it comes. Until it comes. Now you can say what you want to say. Some of you have to absolutely miss your blessing. Some of you just you just miss your blessing. But you can recover. One thing about the word, if you want to follow the word, you can recover. If you don't want to follow the word, you don't have to, all right? Any question before we move on? Any question for me? All right, we're going to move on. Now, Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Now, we're giving you instructions about how you can make next year better for you. This is guaranteed workmanship. Things that are work. Things that are work. Now, for the rest of you, before we go, to, let me tell you what the Lord did today. All right. For you non-believers, we got some non-believers, not all of them, but we got some non-believers in here. Some of you don't think I hear from the Lord. Well, Sister Thompson, you know what? Come up and read that again. Read it again, so I want all of you to hear. I want you to read what Sister Thompson prayed this morning at 2.30. And then I'm going to tell you why she was praying. Had no idea the Lord spoke to me around, I guess around six, and told me what to tell them. Now, I didn't know anything about what she did, but I know the Lord told me to tell them what he told me to tell them. But I'm going to let her read what Sister, because Sister Thompson posted. So evidently she wanted to know, because she posted. So we're going to let y'all non-believers see what happened. Go ahead. Okay, this was December 23rd at 2... 38 a.m. That was yesterday now. Monday. December 23rd. Well, Monday day before yesterday. Monday. Monday. All right, go ahead. That was Monday. Wow, okay. <laughs> go ahead. I am falling on my knees, crying out to you, O Lord. I am screaming, enough is enough. I denounce every religious teaching, mm. every religious oh, thought. Some of y'all ought to do that stuff, too. Get that stuff out of you. And you are... You, you'll see the Lord better. Get that old false mess out of you. Go ahead. 
every religious thought, every religious act mm. that keeps me from holding on to you, that takes my focus off of you. Now stop for a minute. This is a prayer of a very sincere person. A person that's not playing at all. Go ahead. My heart is longing for you, mm. longing for your touch, mm. longing to hear from you. Mm. In this era, I am looking to you to fill me with your precious spirit, to instill in me your power, might, and strength, unashamed, humble, and waiting. Gee. Only you can change this. Help me to remember I am not alone. Lord Jesus. Now, um, I had prophetess to question her. And one of the things that was in her heart was about her transportation. They purchased a motor for their vehicle back in October. I didn't know anything about, anything at all about she praying. And I didn't find out till Monday of this week that they wasn't right when I asked Trusty Parker Jr. And the Lord told me to tell you that if you would have brought that motor here, you would have been riding now. If you would have brought it here, you would have been riding. Why? See the Refuge Christian Center? Y'all pastor have a different standard. It don't take but a few hours to put a motor in a vehicle. Let me say it again. It don't take but a few hours to put a motor in a vehicle. It don't take. And from October to now, you ought to be running. If you would have brought that motor here, there had never been a vehicle, even if they need a motor in it, stay here, and the person on that vehicle had everything and it stayed here that long. The question is, have you ever seen a car that long? Let me say, Monique's car, Ain't nothing wrong with this. She is staying here because she ain't got no place else to keep it. The other car is still here because the person ain't available to get it as of now. Let me tell you why. The Bible tells me whatever I do to help folks, make sure I help my sisters and brothers before I help my family members. That's what my Bible tells me. They are my family. You would have been running in a, at least in a week. Because it don't take but four or five hours to put a motor in a vehicle. I'm not, I'm saying it from what I've done. And the Lord told me just to tell you, you made a mistake. That's what you did. If you would have, now you can take it, y'all can take y'all vehicles wherever you want them. But if the Lord tell me to help you, and you got what you need, you're going to be riding in a few days. I don't care who you are. Now, all of you that had motors put on your car, how many of you have let your car, your car sit here and wait that long? Let me see your hand. How many of you ever had a motor put in your car here? None of you? Well, I guess the ones that had were left. But we had some motors put in people's cars. They sure did. Where is, um, wait a minute, where, where is, um, Vera. Yeah, she had one. We have, you know why? My standard, I keep telling you, my standard is different from these men here. I'm going, I don't care whether you get mad or not. My standards are, my standards are in line with the word. And when my brothers or sisters in need and I can help them, they ain't got to wait. How many of you want to wait on your transportation when you need one? Let me see your hand. Not one of you. Not one of you. That that vehicle would have been riding down the road in a you know in a couple of days. I'll see to it. I'll assign men to do it and do it. And let me let me tell you about you men that got some skill. Let me bring you down off your pride. If you got any skills and you say it's for the help of the kingdom. Let me say it again. If you got any skill, I don't care whether it's uh, education skill or technology skill, it's for the help of the kingdom. It's for you to help your sister and brother. And some of you so messed up with
was self-centered, it ain't funny. You full of pride. Your idea is this. I'm going to help me, and everybody else going to help me, but when it comes to help everybody else, I'm going to take my time. That is at a, that's flat out wrong. And folks, let me tell you this. What you reap is coming back to you. What you sow is because of what you reap. What you reap is called what you sow. Real sisters and brothers help each other. They understand that transportation is needed. So if that vehicle, that motor had been here, they would have been riding by now. Let me say it to all you angry-faced folk looking at me now. If it would have been here, they would have been riding by now. They would have been riding by now. Because the standing here is different than your home. That's what you hear me when I'm be talking about me in here. A lot of you ain't like me. But you can be because I'm going to be like the word. And you can say whatever you want to say. The facts are the truth. And the truth are the facts. When you learn to love each other enough to put each other before you, you're going to see a greater blessing of the Lord. And back to the stove. Because I went out of my way to help them, I got me a bed. That whole a bed that my son needed was in their house. Didn't know it. Didn't help me because the bed was there. But the Lord knew it was in their house. And let me tell you something. My son Lonnie is sleeping in the bed now. Because he couldn't sleep in a regular bed because of that... Um, Brace they got on his leg. He been sleeping in a wheelchair since October. That's all he could. He couldn't lay down. But now he got a real bed. Now, it's long to him. Because it's my bed. I done told him when he leave, that bed stayed at 129 Mary Nether Drive. That bed can raise up, let down, and I done envision myself one, two o'clock in the morning, sitting up in the bed reading my word. So that bed stayed at home. I done told him that. Oh, you that ain't your bed. It's loaned to you. It was it was given to me. Because I asked for it. So I want you to know that. So he un, we have an understanding, all right? But think, but listen to this though. The Lord knew what I was gonna need. And what I was going to need was in them. When you don't help your sister and brothers right, you don't know what you don't miss. Because of your arrogance, your self-centeredness, and your slowness. You don't know what you don't miss. You don't, I guarantee some of you here don't miss your blessing because you didn't move like you're supposed to. And it's going to happen again. You'll be surprised. And I said, Lord, I thank you, Jesus. And that bed has to be, it has to be anyway from a thousand to ten thousand dollars, because them hospital beds ain't cheap. Go check them. And let me tell you this, it worked. It worked. The head and the foot. Oh, I didn't check. It worked. Ain't nothing wrong with it. It's not scratched. It looked new. It just worked. It just worked. It just worked. So now it's at 129 Marinetta. It done found a home. And that's why the Lord said for you to love each other. When you learn how to love each other the right way, you will find out there's always a blessing in it because you're doing it the Lord's way. All right? Any other question before we move on? Any other question? We're trying to help y'all because I'm going to follow this. Whether you follow or not, I'm going to follow this. All right? Now, Okay, Matthew 6, 33. Listen to what it says. Now, if you want to be blessed this next year, you can't interpret this the way you want to. You have to understand this the way it's written, folks. Matthew 6, 33. Take a good look at it. It said, first see, in order for you to be a disciple, you're going to have to, first, you have to make up in, the Lord ain't going to make it up for you. You're going to have to decide, you know what? Your kingdom going to be first. And then everything else 
I like to have or won't go be central. I'm going to make sure your kingdom is first in my life. Isn't that in your Bible? Somebody tell me what that means. Go to the mic. Well, that means that you put with the word anything above yourself, not him second, because he won't be second. He's first. Okay, can anybody tell me, interpret what that means? Now, the minister said, I want to see what some of you all say. And I want you to think about what you're saying before you say it. And while you're saying it, ask yourself, are you doing it? Go ahead. If I'm supposed to be here at the ministry to do a work, but I choose not to be or go do what I want to do or go to my job instead of being here at the ministry. Go ahead. Making sure that I'm available for the Lord to use me and being in a place that I'm supposed to be in, in ministry. Okay. That scripture means that you have come to a place of understanding in your spirit, whether you hear or not, whatever he wants you to do is first. From your heart. Not because you're made to, but Lord, I just want to. I just want to do this. I want to serve you. I want to, I'm available for you. I'm here. I'm just available. And it's not because I want a blessing, but it's because I'm receiving one. I'm being blessed. I'm saved. I'm just saved. Because I didn't used to think like this. Ain't no way in the world you can get me to waste my time. I want to be in a place where I understand it's a blessing for me to serve you at all times, at all costs. That's what, that's what that scripture means. First seek ye the kingdom, not second, but first. And one thing I found out about the Lord, even more so every day, when you do that, the Lord going to make sure what you got to do, get help. He going to make sure whatever you got to do in this world, you going to get help. You gonna get help. He going people. It it works. It really it really works. It re, it really re, sometimes I tell you about the things the Lord does in my life. Even when I'm working on my car, them folk that come around to the house they get blessed because they see how the Lord bless me. Even when problems arise, the Lord will give us a solution. He's helping. He's helping. He, the Lord has stopped the rain many days for me, even here. Stop it. And wait till I'm finished, then it start raining again. You can say whatever you want to say, but long as it will stop, I'm fine. <laughs> That's it. And are we trying to help you? Because you need help for next year. And you can't help yourself, I'm telling you. Look at your life. You can't do enough to help you. That's why some of you come in here with them old sad, tired faces. With that mean attitude. Wait a minute. I know I didn't do nothing. You just got here. No joy. You know, you know who you are. No joy, no peace. You know why? You're trying to do it yourself. You ought to let the Lord in your life and let him show you how to do it, all right? Any question for